testing. We good? All right. All right. Welcome back to the afternoon portion of our spring 2022 Dayhon lecture. Before we begin, I want to express thanks to the Dayhon committee, who is chaired by Father Charles Brown, couldn't be here today, served by Dr. Paul Munson and Dr. Brian Lee. I need to give thanks to Emily Nolge, our special events liaison for handling all the details, Jenny Dubzicki and Kathy Hardy for handling the live stream, who we had quite a few people on this morning, so thank you for doing that. I also need to thank maintenance, food service, design, hospitality, finance, IT, front desk, really all faculty and staff it takes to pull off a day like today. Our president rector for your continued leadership throughout very trying times. And again, the SCJs, because without them, we could not have had this event today. So thank you to all of you. All right, so the afternoon is going to go a little bit like this. <laughs> we'll have our response by Father James. Um, Paul will come up first and introduce the next seminary and reflection and then the response. Brother Guy will have a few minutes of a response after that. And then um, Paul will open it up to Q&A. Um, a couple people did ask just to clarify that process. So you can submit questions via that QR code or there's going to be a microphone here and there. You can line up socially distanced and ask your questions live. Okay. We hope to wrap up by 3 p.m. Father Raul will give the closing prayer and send us along on our way. So with that, I'm going to invite Paul up to the podium. Thank you, Monica. Um, Brother Guy's wonderful lecture this morning um, reminded me that in terms of uncertainty and risk, we should all thank someone in this room that I forgot, uh, neglected to mention this morning. Uh, the science pilgrimage uh, down to Arizona at the Vacuum Observatory was made possible by what was called the Science for Seminaries Grant through the American Association for the Advancement of Science. I had a colleague that approached me, and also Dr. Jeremy Blackwood, who's not here today because he's on sabbatical, that we should apply for this very generous grant for Sacred Heart. All I could think was, that's a lot of work, and you're kind of crazy. <laughs> but he convinced me, and that is our dear Dr. James Stroud in the back, who actually, in a way, sort of set things in motion to bringing Brother Guy here to, uh, and Father James um, to Sacred Heart. So thank you very much, James. I'd like to call up um, one of our um, uh, participants of the Science Pilgrimage, also, and it's, it's crazy to believe now, also a transitional deacon, um, Deacon Ariel Azroco, where are you? Orozco. Ariel, I hope you, you forgive me. Ariel? <laughs> Did we find him? All right then, well. <laughs> So instead of a, uh, well, okay, um, instead, and, and that's okay, Ariel was very kind. Um, uh, Deacon Ariel had, um, was willing to step in because uh, Deacon Matthew Bovey was unable to be here um, this afternoon to introduce um, a priest from his diocese, the Diocese of the Cross, uh, Father James. So instead, uh, Deacon Matthew, a uh, wonderful man he is, actually emailed me with his remarks and an introduction for Father James. So um, uh, I will read this. I will try to channel my inner Matthew Bovey. Um, uh, but here we go. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I apologize that I cannot be present this afternoon. I felt under the weather this morning and as a precaution decided that it was best to stay home today. About three years ago, I took the opportunity to go on a faith and science pilgrimage to Tucson, Arizona through Sacred Heart with a generous grant that they had received. It was an extraordinary and exciting experience. We had the opportunity to meet Brother Guy. He gave us a tour of his facilities. I remember that he paused the tour to admire, if memory recalls correctly, a rock sample from the moon. Rock sample, excuse me, from the moon. He looked like a kid in a toy store. My impression of that moment was someone who knew from his intellectual and scientific studies what this rock was, and from that, the one who had created this lunar rock. My highlight of the pilgrimage was the trip to Kitt Peak. My undergraduate degree is in math and physics education, and my favorite courses were ones in astronomy. To view the stars through a telescope from an observatory was a dream come true. It was stunning to watch the sun descend atop an Arizona mountain. It was breathtaking to see the Pleiades, a cluster of seven stars that fell closer through the lens of a telescope. I grew deeper to God. As a father, I believe that God created this playground called the universe to be enjoyed by his children. I suspect that our responder today has had a similar experience. He is a priest from my home diocese, the Diocese of La Crosse. He grew up in the small rural town of Amherst, attended UW Stevens Point for applied music, and after two years of work, he attended Mundelein Seminary to discern his priestly vocation. Since his ordination on June 28, 2003, he has served in a number of roles, including associate pastor, school chaplain, associate vocations director, and pastor again. His current role is pastor of St. Olaf Parish in Eau Claire, and he teaches introduction to philosophy for the diaconal formation program. Father James' interest in science is in the field of astronomy. He is a hobby astronomer, a member of the Chippewa Valley Astronomical Association and the La Crosse Area Astronomical Society. His involvement with the Vatican Observatory is with the development of the first Faith and Astronomy Workshop, which is designed for parish educators and clergy that are not professional scientists. He knows his faith and his science well. Without further ado, I introduce, on behalf of Deacon Matthew, to you, Father James Kuczynski. Thank you, and uh, please let the good deacon know that uh, he once again, as many have over my years of priesthood, show that I'm not a prophet, because the scripture states that no prophet is accepted in their home diocese. <laughs> that, was, that was a rather non-prophetic introduction. <laughs> um, thank you. It's a, it's a joy for me to be here. This is my third time uh, here with you at Sacred Heart. Uh, seminary. And um, just a couple of notes. If uh, I thought of ha saying this as I was listening to Brother Guy, I will kind of use language in my presentation that protects confidentiality. Um, not only just in the general sense, but being that a lot of my brothers are here as I was putting this together, because I really wanted to emphasize practical experience. There's literally situations from like, I am 99% sure that some of you, if not all of you, know this person. <laughs> so I will use the word friend in this, in the Adelphos Adelphae um, sense, as you, those are into uh, apologetics. It can mean parishioner, it can mean friend, it can be a non-friend, <laughs> but it's going to be used in the expansive sense of people I know in different capacities, just, and again, just in the spirit of protecting their confidentiality. Um, so with that, let us begin. First of all, I wanna thank the seminary community here at Sacred Heart for inviting me to be the respondent to Brother Guy's presentation as my third visit here. Uh, your warm welcome, hospitality, and charity toward me is a gift I deeply appreciated, and we're just, talking about that right after Mass on how you so excel at hospitality here. And being that I have spoken at a couple other seminaries, that's not always the case. So thank you so much um, for that gift of hospitality. I also want to thank my brothers from the Diocese of La Crosse 
um, and especially those who were able to join me for our nightcap last night. It was a true blessing, and thank you, Father Krasuski, for overwatching our priest wannabes from the diocese. <laughs> Keep up the good work. <laughs> it's also a blessing to be with you, Brother Guy. Um, in full disclosure, Guy and I have gotten to know each other well over the years. When asked to be the respondent for his presentation, my first thought would be, is it a conflict of interest for me to be the respondent, being I write for his blog, Sacred Space Astronomy? Um, but it only took a few seconds for me to have that fear and concern removed, since your encouragement to me from day one has always been, write what moves you. So considering that, I feel no need to hold back any personal thoughts on your presentation, since I know you would be disappointed in me if I did. At the same time, if my name is removed tomorrow morning from the con contributing authors to Sacred Space Astronomy, all of you will know, now know why. <laughs> so what is my approach to this response? My approach to responding to Brother Guy's presentation will be in the spirit of observation. Brother Guy offered you a commentary, not only on COVID-19, but the relationship between faith and science, specifically in the United States. Therefore, my approach will be to explore, do I see Brother Guy's vision at play in my observatory of St. Olaf Parish in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and in my priestly ministry as a whole? I'll also offer my own thoughts on the perceived cultural divide between faith and science. So to begin with, I wish to present to you something that you should be quite accustomed to as seminarians, dry information that nobody cares about. <laughs> In other words, what do we know about COVID-19? <laughs> COVID-19 is the name given to the disease produced by one type of coronavirus. The name coronavirus is given to the disease with a corona or crown of spike proteins that act as the connection points for the virus. It is the SARS family of viruses, severe acute respiratory syndrome, and has been given the scientific designation SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV-1 was the scientific designation given for the SARS virus that broke out in 2003. COVID-19 has a wide variance of impact on its recipients from asymptomatic to death. To date, over 12,000 deaths have occurred in the state of Wisconsin since late 2019. Over, as I wrote this, 880,000, but I believe it was yesterday, the number is now over 900,000 have died in the United States. In that same time, 5.6 million people have died worldwide from COVID-19. But put these numbers in perspective, 675,000 people in the United States, not globally, in the United States, died from the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918. And depending on what Civil War historian you read, um, between 620,000 and 750,000 people died in the Civil War. Obviously, these numbers need to be read in proportion to population. But I think it's safe to say that COVID-19 has left and is continuing to leave a sad historical mark on our country and our world. As an aside tip from a current pastor to future pastors, be careful sharing with your parishioners while the mortality rate of COVID-19 is less than 1%, so COVID-19 isn't that serious. Two weeks ago, a young parishioner who denied that COVID-19 existed in my parish lost her mother to COVID-19 and doesn't know how to handle it since until a couple weeks ago, COVID didn't exist in her mind. One thing for sure, she could care less about statistical abstracts for the sake of rhetoric. My deep condolences to you and your friend who lost their father. In regard to abortion, to get exact numbers is difficult due to legal differences of how, how abortions are reported from state to state. But sadly, abortion still dwarfs the cited statistics with a conservative estimate of well over 2 million abortions that have occurred in the United States during this pandemic. As of the day that I write this response about a week or two-ish ago, there are currently 11 COVID-19 variants being observed 
two more under the Omicron tree have been um, identified since I wrote this. Alpha, Beta, Delta, Gamma, Epsilon, Eta, Yoda, Kappa, Mu, Omicron, and Zeta. And that is my first connection with faith, Koine Creek. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's in, that's in. <laughs> <laughs> of these, two variants are of concern, Delta and Omicron. Both variants can create serious illness, but Omicron is rightly considered less lethal than Delta. In speaking with a good friend of mine who does pharmaceutical research at Virginia Commonwealth University, both Delta and Omicron can create serious illness. It's just that Omicron is less aggressive in lung tissue than Delta is. But at the same time, for those who have pre-existing lung conditions, Omicron can still be lethal. Currently, we have 10 different COVID vaccines globally that are in use. 10 more are still in development phase. Three have received full recognition from the FDA, Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson. Pfizer and Moderna are RNA vaccines, while Johnson & Johnson is a DNA vaccine. Later on, I'll discuss the bioethical questions of vaccines. But for now, in summary, Pfizer and Moderna were developed without the use of embryonic stem cells, while tainted lines were used in the development of Johnson & Johnson. All three vaccines use tainted stem cell lines in the testing phase. I start with this not to presume you didn't know any of this or try to impress you with what I have learned about COVID-19, but rather I start here to emphasize what we do know about COVID-19 in the hopes of avoiding the wild cultural polemics Brother Guy referenced in his presentation. Put another way, let's step back, <laughs> breathe deep, unless you're sitting next to someone, I'm just saying, <laughs> um, <laughs> and realize we're all on the same team in this room, even though there is a Jesuit among us. <laughs> <laughs> I waited for three weeks to deliver that line. <laughs> I deeply appreciate Brother Guy's forthright support of vaccination while also pointing out the fallibility of science. As someone who also supports vaccination, I am thankful for the gift of science to provide safe and effective vaccines and treatments for COVID-19. In fact, I can recount many times when I was not only thankful for the gift of science, but saw it as a gift from God. When my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer while I was in seminary, I was thankful for the gift of nuclear medicine that has allowed my mother a long and healthy life. Chemotherapy is not perfect. She still deals with some of the side effects of chemotherapy to this day, but they are crosses she bears with joy as she continues to love our family and her God. My support of vaccination has come with a price, however. There are some who have called me godless or fear I'm losing my faith because I blindly trust vaccinations. Faith over fear is the mantra of one of my friends whenever the subject of COVID-19 pro 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 protocols in the pews is mentioning. Social distancing, masks, sanitizing, and contact tracing are all about fear in his eyes. Father, just have faith in God that he'll protect us at Mass and do away with all this silliness. To dovetail off of Brother Guy's presentation about the complicated interpretations of follow the science, to my friend who has a heart big as all outdoors, and he would give the shirt off his back for anyone in this room. Good man. Faith equals God will protect us regardless of what decisions we make. And fear equals, huh, what does fear equal? Does it equal science? To a point, does it equal selling out to what he perceives as the political corruption of our society? In part, yeah. Does fear also mean embracing things he himself is not comfortable with? Because if he did, he might become afraid and have his faith and confidence shaken. Now I think we're getting a clearer picture. To seek a theological answer to this question and approach, 
Remember, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Both fear of the Lord and wisdom are gifts of the Holy Spirit, many of which speak of the right use of our minds. It reminds us that we are a people that embrace faith and reason, reason that includes the natural sciences. Therefore, as clear and pithy as faith over fear sounds to give us confidence during a national pandemic, oftentimes faith embraces fear and confronts it in a way that doesn't leave us huddled in the corner, but helps us face uncertainties so we may grow in wisdom. Put another way, faith embraces science, our broken political system, and our insecurities. So God can heal the broken vessels we become. Fear in its proper context can become our strength with the help of God's grace. As of late, I've been the recipient of another kind of Christmas criticism in regard to COVID-19. Imagine that, people have strong opinions about COVID-19 these days. Can't imagine. I'm sure all of you are just right on board together in the same camp with that, aren't you? I stupidly shared with some of my parishioner that I am delaying getting my booster shot at the request of my doctor. Guess what the parish rumor mill did with that one? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm just going like it. <laughs> Have I lost faith in vaccines? Nope. I had an appointment with my doctor, and I asked her about getting a booster. This is the same doctor who encouraged me to get vaccinated and told me I had no good reason not to get vaccinated. When we talked about a booster, she said to me, knowing your health history and examining the science of boosting makes me want you to wait. Please trust me. And when I'm comfortable with what I see in the data, I'll have you get boosted. End of discussion for me. I trust my doctor. Now, is my doctor losing faith in vaccines? No. She is simply being my doctor. At the same time, some people are now considering me COVID light because I delayed getting boosted. And this experience raised a question in my ministerial heart. Is what people perceive as support or rejection of vaccination really about a conflict of faith and science or is it coming from some other place? Meaning that to my doctor, the science wasn't clear enough in her mind that given on what's going on in my body, which I'm not necessarily comfortable sharing with you, <laughs> this could be a good thing. It might not be a good thing. She needed to do some more research on it. Versus, boost me now, <laughs> you know. You can flip this both ways depending on what the circumstance is. As Brother Guy has pointed out, the Catholic Church strongly encourages vaccination. Pope Francis has used forceful language to the faithful to get vaccinated. I also have experienced parishioners and friends with medical conditions that led their doctor to not just say, don't get boosted, but to encourage them not to get vaccinated. And Brother Guy mentioned that too with the Vatican, that there are circum situations. A friend of mine in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, worked at one of the local hospitals as a nurse. The hospital in question presented a vaccine mandate, um, but she requested a medical exemption. My friend has a rare form of MS, and her doctor, who works for the same healthcare system, strongly encouraged her not to get vaccinated because it could potentially be life-threatening given the uniqueness of her medical condition and the medications used to treat this condition. When she made her petition for exemption through her doctor, her request was denied, and she was fired from her job a week later. This is someone, ironically, who wants to get vaccinated, but can't without going off the medicine that treats her MS. I think it's safe to say that regardless of where you stand on the vaccine question, something went horribly wrong here something didn't go quite right. Now, 
since I've written this, a quick aside, she did call me to say that they're reconsidering her situation, which I was happy about because it felt like something went awry. Another friend of mine called me a while back to announce, Father James, I don't want to get vaccinated. I asked my friend, why? He answered, and gosh, I wish I could tell you who it is, because if you, if you know who it was, it would be even funnier, but I'm not going to get vaccinated just because Joe Biden or the Pope thinks I should. <laughs> I'm one of the few people I can laugh at that statement and he doesn't get torqued off at me. <laughs> A week later, when former President Donald Trump supported vaccination in a political rally to a chorus of boos, my friend continued to resist getting vaccinated and, st and stated that our political system is going to pot. I actually don't disagree with him, actually. I, mean, <laughs> I just think I, our reasons for going to pot might be in disagreement. Again, I ask, what is motivating our decisions with COVID-19? Is it faith? Is it science? Is it politics? Or is it something else? When the vaccines were announced, there wasn't much hesitation for me to get vaccinated. Given my health, the green light from my doctor, any minor risks of vaccination were much more acceptable than the risk of contracting COVID. At the same time, I did have a few moments of hesitation. Why, you may ask? I don't like shots. <laughs> I never have. In fact, I don't even like taking ibuprofen when I have a headache. I'm usually, I'll, I usually presume that I'm just dehydrated and start pounding water. I don't like taking pills for my ills and I just presume I'm healthy enough. Default male response to just about any illness. <laughs> <laughs> That being said, there's a hard truth developing in my life. Even though I'm still young, I am 48 years old, and each year, each year is introducing a new physical cross for me to bear. I bought my first pill organiz organizer um, and so that I can keep track of my daily prescribed cocktail of medication and vitamin supplements my doctor wants me to take. One of my former students who is finishing her doctorate at Texas Tech in diet, as a dietitian enrolled me in their program on obesity as part of her dissertation. She said to me, quote, I'm the kind of candidate they're trying to help. <laughs> She meant it as an encouragement. <laughs> and thankfully, because I've known this student for about 10 years, I took it as such. But I had to smile when she said, <laughs> wow. <laughs> I am happy to report I've been on it one week and I'm already seeing, not necessarily here, but here and here good changes. This journey has shown me that getting older stinks. And ironically, I think that for many, the initial reasons why people didn't want to receive vaccination is simply because they don't like to use medicine if they don't need it. I really think that that is just a commonsensical thing we can ad admit. In many ways, this intuition to resist medication is good. Not only for the reasons Brother Guy mentioned in his presentation about medicines and vaccines that have failed, but it's common knowledge we're living in an era of overprescription of medicine. One of the biggest problems in the United States, and especially Wisconsin, is the opioid crisis in which prescription pain medication is being used. I recall a presentation in the Diocese of La Crosse at Priest Unity Days in which a priest who works at a substance abuse center for clergy stated that alcohol abuse is no longer the top problem of priests in his facility. Instead, the new problem is abuse of pain medication. To share another observation from Brother Guy I agree with, we are sadly more comfortable self-medicating our problems instead of trusting the best trained scientist who knows more about parts of us than our family members do, our doctor. Now, quick clarification. Some of you sharp seminarians might think, that sounds like a contradiction. Over prescription of medication, trust your doctor. Who prescribes the medication? <laughs> so why should I trust my doctor? Over prescription of medication is a complex issue. Are there certain doctors that rush too quick to prescribing medicine? Absolutely. 
That's why I'm glad that my doctor's default answer when I come in to see her is rub some dirt on it. <laughs> because that also builds the trust in me when she says, you need to take something. I know that being that she doesn't like to prescribe medications I don't need, I need to listen to her. Also over prescription, there's tactics that can be used. And I'm sure that you've seen them in the waiting room. You know, the parent who has brought their child in for the seventh time because their kid has sniffles and is demanding that the doctor give them something. And then the doctor relents and gives them something they don't need, but they just want to get them off their back. Or other tactics such as, you know, trying to fill, not physicians, but patients trying to fill prescriptions at two different pharmacies or going to two different doctors. Don't get any ideas. <laughs> That's, I mentioned this just from the standpoint of overprescription is a complex thing. It's not as simple as one may think. Now, at the same time, even though I resist just default, the desire to, to have medication. There are things that we need to, that we have, that we need to overcome our fears and realize we're not invincible. Sometimes we need the medicine. I'm glad my mother okay, overcame her fear of the cross and aftermath of chemotherapy when she knew it would fundamentally change her physical reality for the rest of her life to treat her breast cancer. If she hadn't, she may have had to be present at my ordination from the perspective of the communion of saints. Selfishly, I'm glad my mother delayed her transition from this life to eternal life. Now, in addition to practical things, there are doctrinal questions we need to look at. Beyond the simple reasons for resisting vaccination, lies doctrinal questions for us as Catholics. As I mentioned above, tainted lines of stem cells were used in the testing of three approved vaccines. Vaccines have been a hot button topic for Catholics far before COVID-19 was a reality. Coming of age as a Catholic in the 80s and 90s, St. John Paul II's strong opposition to abortion and offering material support for abortion, avoiding it, um, weighed heavy on many of us. As a young Catholic of the JP2 era, our mantra was the cafeteria is closed, meaning we weren't going to be the Catholics that only embraced part of church teaching. We were going to embrace all of church teaching. I had seven pages that I deleted just on that phrase. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for that. <laughs> In light of this, many friends of mine chose not to have their children vaccinated for measles, mumps, and rubella. I recall how divisive this topic became, not only in the church, but also among families and as parents couldn't understand why their children, who then had their own children, wouldn't get their children vaccinated, their grandchildren vaccinated. This confusion prompted the Pope formerly known as Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, while serving as the prefect of the Congregation of the Faith, to ask the Pontifical Academy of Life to study the issue. In her response to Cardinal Ratzinger in 2005, Mrs. Deborah Vinich, I probably botched that last name, laid out the findings of the Academy in regard to the relation between MMR vaccinations and abortion. To summarize, it must be confirmed that, and this is directly from her letter to Cardinal Ratzinger, there is a grave responsibility to use alternative vaccines and to make a conscientious objection with regard to those which have moral problems. That was point one. Point two, as regards the vaccines without an alternative, meaning none of them are clean, so then what do you do? The need to consent so that others may be prepared must be reaffirmed, as should be the lawfulness of using the former in the meantime, in so much as, the, as is necessary in order to avoid a serious risk, not only for one's own children, but also, and perhaps more specifically, for the health conditions of the population as a whole, especially for pregnant women, the common good. It's not only something that's personal, but communal. 
The lawfulness of the use of these vaccines should not be misinterpreted as a declaration of lawfulness of their production, marketing, and use, but is to be understood as being a passive material cooperation and, in the midst and remotest sense, also active, morally justified as an extrema ratio due to the necessity to provide for the good of one's children and of the people who come in contact with the children, um, specifically pregnant women. This is something that I, I think we all need to keep in mind because I have heard so many people say to me, Father, the church is throwing out its pro-life stance with these vaccines. Actually, it's not. It's continuing that tradition. We'll get into that um, you know, as we get further into this. Such co cooperation occurs in a context of moral coercion on the conscience of parents who are forced to choose to act against their conscience or otherwise to put the health of their children and of the population as a whole at risk. This is an unjust alternative choice, which must be eliminated as soon as possible. So in summary, um, these principles have become the starting point for ethical questions on vaccines and abortions. In short, we as Catholics should demand that vaccines and medicine in general be developed in a way that avoids material cooperation with abortion. The primary culpability lay upon researchers and developers, but when possible, we the patients should seek out alternative treatments that do not re result in providing material cooperation with abortion. When there is, is no other alternative, the principle of double effect kicks in and it is morally justified to receive vaccines or treatments when there is a grave threat to one's personal health and or society. When this decision was rendered, it did sway the opinions of some of my friends to have their children receive the MMR vaccination. However, to this day, there are many of my friends who was like, no. I'm not going to have my children vaccinated. I mentioned this to affirm that the question about the anti-vax movement is quite complex and was already a reality before COVID-19. So yes, I do agree with Brother Guy that politics played a role in the anti-vax movement, but also too, and it's not necessarily disagreement, I know that you would agree as well, the seeds of the movement had already been planted, watered, and grown. When the USCCB's ethicist released a statement on COVID-19 vaccines, it echoed, as it should, the findings of the Pontifical Academy of Life from 2005. The USCCB provides a clear summary of the ethical questions about COVID-19. Um, I'll read to you two of the Q&As that I find most helpful for this presentation. One, do COVID vaccines use aborted derived stem cells? And then I mentioned to you as of date, um, Pfizer and Moderna didn't use them in development, did use them in testing. And here they make reference to Janssen, I'm presuming that's Johnson & Johnson, that there was um, tainted lines in both production and in, um, and also in the testing phase. It's also kind of funny too, this, the statement here from the beginning of the pandemic from the USCCB spoke of hundreds of vaccines are being developed and it's true. Now we're down to 10 in use and 10 in development. It reminds me a lot of what Brother Guy oftentimes talk about of in science, that human dimension that don't think that there was a rush to discover for monetary reasons. I mean, there's a lot of money to be made um, in the vaccine, not just the COVID, any vaccination field. Again, does that mean we just fundamentally distrust it? Because, you know, and, and the, the thing I often think of as I preached about at our mass this morning, clergy sex abuse scandal, should somebody leave the church because a handful of priests have uh, molested children, I'm presuming that everybody in this room as seminarians would say, no, that's not a good idea. But at the same time, we also know too that when we universalize something that's legitimately broken and suddenly make that the default reality of everything, we can easily reject just about anything. You know, we can find corruption in any organization. And so therefore we need to keep that in mind. 
Um, also, too, then, in question two, it also mentioned on how Pfizer and Moderna, being that they didn't use in development, are cleaner. And it just mentioned, though, specifically AstraZeneca and Jan Johnson & Johnson raised more moral concerns, even though the church approved all four, given the grave threat that COVID-19 uh, er, uh, presents to us. Um, it also says the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith has noted that vaccination is not, as a rule, a moral obligation, and that therefore it must be voluntary. In any case, from the ethical point of view, the morality of vaccination depends not only on the duty to protect one's own health, but also the, du the duty to pursue the common good. And it's said that in the absence of other means to stop and even protect, prevent the epidemic, vaccination may pr uh, promote the common good, especially to protect the weakest and most exposed. For a vaccine uh, can be effective, and then a lot of this then goes into basically just echoing Brother Guy's presentation. Um, the congregation also said, those that who refuse to get vaccinated must do their utmost by taking all the necessary precautions to avoid becoming vehicles for the transmission of, of the infection agent. In particular, they must avoid any risk to the health of those who cannot be vaccinated for medical, uh, for medical or other reasons and who are the most vulnerable. Now, I'm not gonna hesitate on anything Brother Guy said, but I will avoid putting my head into the Pope's mouth, into the lion's mouth of the Pope, and I'll refrain from commenting on the Pope's decision to deem non-vaccination a sin of pride at the Vatican. Um, my theological gut says, the Pope was speaking as a pastor and not a theologian when he made that, that statement. I will put my head in the lion's mouth. Obviously, if the church teaches, the vaccines have to be, you know, they're, they're not mandatory, they have to be voluntary. There becomes issues of objectively calling it a sin of pride. Can the reasons not to get vaccinated constitute a sin of pride? Yes, but it's, those of you who are moral theologians, you're, and I'm not one, you can do a much better job than me of parsing out the theological, you know, persnickities of, of, uh, of what all that all entails. Now, I do agree that whether you be at the Vatican, the seminary, or the parishes, whether vaccinated or not, our concern always needs to be for the common good. So therefore, vaccine is the clearest pathway, and I agree with the Pope on that to protect the common good. And the decision not to get vaccinated does not exempt one from protecting the common good. And I think that that's a very important thing to emphasize. Again, I share this not to try to wow you. I'm not a moral theologian, and I'm sure there's many of you that can poke holes into my presentation on moral grounds. The point is to agree with Brother Guy's insight that much of what we are facing in our culture is a growing distrust with authority. Meaning that, you know, okay, Cardinal Rotzinger has the Pontifical Academy of Life. They studied it. Here's, a, here's a, a, you know, a resolution. You can't have your children vaccinated. <clears throat> no, I'm not going to do that. And sadly, I see, for lack of a better term, a neo-relativism being created in the parish um, of, let's do this. No, why? I don't want to. Well, should we do this, 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 and this? I don't care. Um, it's becoming relativism. I remember when I was in seminary was always kind of the, we as seminarians, it was kind of like liberal progressive relativism. <laughs> but there is a conservative relativism that I'm seeing that's starting to grow and get steam as well under the guise of similar to my friend. Who cares what the Pope says? Who cares what anybody in authority says? I just don't want to do it. Um, that is, for those of you who are moral theologians, one of the definitions of freedom that you study, but I think it's safe to say that the definition of freedom, to embrace the definition of freedom is, I have to do whatever I want regardless of consequence is not a morally legitimate embrace. Instead, what is the morally legitimate embrace? To choose the greatest good.
for both yourself and the greatest amount of people and for the common good. That is what our choice needs to be rooted in. Beyond the playful banter that we all go through as pastors, um, whoops, I'm sorry, I skipped a section here. Um, now, to that point of the biggest problem is a distrust with authority, not to scare you, but guess what, future priests of God? Guess what's coming for you and your parishes? <laughs> what is the biggest problem that we face as current priests or future priests? trying to get our parish on the same page about anything. <laughs> if you want to see relativism on full display, go to a parish council meeting. <laughs> and I say that with love. I love the people I serve. The days of Father Knows Best are gone. And if anything, I've come to learn that the default response of the parishioner in the pew to anything I say is, and the priest has said it, so we won't do it. And said it often, who does this man in black think he is? <laughs> Don't misread what I say. I love priesthood. And this is the playful banter. Beyond the playful banter we all go through as pastors, there is a cultural shift away from trusting authority, especially in youth. To resist organizational, organizational superstructures is the battle cry of the day. In my six years of college ministry, I saw this clearly, whether it be the church, big box stores, corporate America, the medical industry, the default answer was always distrust, except for TikTok. <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> And I say that sadly, not as a joke. <laughs> I say that sadly as the truth. Dear brothers, beware of social media. It can rip your soul to shreds. It's ripping the people you serve soul to shreds. It rips truth to shreds. I had a painful experience with this when I gave a presentation on Pope Emeritus Bank the Sixteenth's writings on care for creation, how he took the Vatican off the Roman power grid, was given the nickname the Green Pope, and how care for creation has been part of our social doctrine past. Basically, Pope Bank the Sixteenth, he's drawing from all of these organizational structures from the past to show the consistency of what it is that we believe. What did I receive at the end? I was looking into the misty gaze of disengaged college students, all wondering, so do we separate the garbage and recycling or not? <laughs> what I mean is they could have cared less about what Pope Bank the 16th had to say. They could have cared less of my ability to kind of have this intimate, you know, delicate um, threading of all the seven themes of Catholic social teaching into this fundament. They were just like, when's the protest rally and where do we go? <laughs> emotionalism. That something is future priests. And I think that emotionalism is really sparking a lot of the debate too with COVID protocols is really running this. As a quick aside, um, I think I'm, oh yeah, I'm doing good on time. Um, that uh, something that isn't part of my presentation, but I, it just hit me last night as I was going through it. One of the things that disturbs me about elections, I'm not just talking about president, but I mean, you can also see it in local elections too is we no longer want to objectively elect a candidate. We wanna be part of a movement. We wanna be swept into something. We want to not just think who would be the best person to run our country or who would be the best city dog catcher. You know, it, it's more of, I want you to help me arrest my logic so I can just get angry. And that's something on both ends of the spectrum. I see clear as mud. <laughs> and those of you who know me, that's one of my Father James-isms. So, in short, I learned the hard way to try to teach any things on the grounds of the church says so is a dangerous endeavor. If anything, what I discovered were many millennials and Gen Z in my college ministry who would say, 
I don't trust the church, but I trust you. Now, this mentality may be flattering to one's ego. It's also a grave danger. If, the engage, if their engagement with the church is based on their trust in me and their trust in you, what happens if the next priest doesn't connect with them? What happens when I make a mistake? What happens when I accidentally utter heresy from the pulpit? Burn him. <laughs> um, do people walk in and out of our doors because of the gospel? Or because what they think of us? Future priests of God avoid at all costs the neoclericalism of developing a cult of personality parish. It not only will injure your priesthood, it'll destroy a parish. Every parish should be able to survive well after the Lord calls you home. Therefore, to conclude my response to Brother Guy, we are in a very dangerous space these days, emotionally, spiritually, politically, in our society. The danger isn't over whether you are Democrat or Republican. It's not even over whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian or someone who is COVID heavy or COVID light. The dangerous space we find ourselves in is disregarding the fundamental human dignity that is the foundation of the church's social teaching. The danger is falling into the trap of seeing my neighbor as a potential disease. The danger is falling into the trap of embracing a mentality of being okay with people dying because we don't want to embrace safety provisions to protect the common good. The danger is practicing the worst form of idolatry possible. The worship of our own opinions is infallible doctrine. In one of the best media presentations I have ever seen on the debate between faith and science, to pull up Bishop Barron, run, don't walk to wherever and watch this as soon as you can. Produced by the BBC simply titled Science Versus Faith, the late Rabbi Sachs and Richard Dawkins were exploring the question, can an aggressive atheist acknowledge that religion can be a good for society? At one point, Rabbi Sachs complimented Dr. Dawkins for rejecting the notion that the science of natural selection should be made into a social theory. Dawkins states, I'm a passionate Darwinian when we answer how we get here, but I am a passionate anti-Darwinian when it comes to deciding what kind of society we want to live in. Of the many things I abhor in the writings of Richard Dawkins, I am in agreement with him on this one point, as in the church, with the caveat that when we talk about evolution, we're not talking about Darwinianism that is fundamentally atheistic, but more of the, we can observe, back to the 16th, had a beautiful response to German clergy, I think it was 2014, when he was asked about this, and he said, Deny evolution right now, priests of Germany, speaking as Pope, is absurd because there's so much evidence for it. Why would we want to reject it? That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about saying that Darwinianism, and in fact, Darwinianism is exactly what Dawkins was against. And how I shuddered when I heard a friend of mine who, a COVID, who opposed COVID-19 restrictions say to me, Father James, the weak will die, and you need to get over that fact. No, I will not get over that fact. In the spirit of St. Paul's critique of the Corinthians who were engaging in sexual immorality that not even the pagans did, my friends in Christ, not even Richard Dawkins, thinks natural selection should guide our political lives. To quote Bishop Barron, when I had him as a teacher at Mundelein Seminary, dear future priests of God, avoid extremism in your ministry or risk becoming the very thing you claim to detest. Thank you. Guy, do you want to offer a few comments?
comments Just a few. Huh. Having spoken so long this morning, I don't have a whole lot more to say except first, thank you. Um, I threatened to say, Father James, you ignorant slut. <laughs> but uh, only those of you of a certain age would appreciate the, uh, the source of the humor. We have some more taste in movies. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, is shot, it completely jerked out the first thing I was going to say. The, the one point that I hope I made that I took from my own game, you write things, you've all written sermons, and you go, where did that come from? And I'm not telling the parishioners I need, that you, they need to hear it. I'm saying I need to hear that. The part of my talk this morning that I took away that, oh, I need to hear, is a reminder that we all have our different strengths are different places where we find God. And Father James gave a talk I could not give because I'm not a diocesan priest. I've never been a seminarian. He's dealing with a parish full of wonderful people who um, I would be much easier dealing with Martians than dealing with them. There is a reason I'm a brother and not a priest. When I first thought of the priesthood, uh, it was to get out of the freshman dorms at Boston College because I was sick of being around all these stupid guys who would come to me with their problems and all I could think of was, of course you got problems, you're stupid, you know, life is tough when you're stupid. <laughs> I'm told this is not good pastoral care. <laughs> and so while I really wanted to make my talk about science and faith. I had to start with COVID because it's the elephant in the room. And you jumped on top of the elephant and rode it around and revealed, you know, sides that I was in no position to even talk about, to which I say thank you. At the end of the day, all decisions are really tough. You mentioned your mother recovering from cancer. You have to have faith in the doctor, but you also have to have enough self-awareness to say, this doesn't sound right, maybe I need to find another doctor. And those decisions are impossible to calculate, and they're impossible to say this is the, the five signs and therefore I will. You need friends, you need people you can trust, who will tell you more than just yes, you're always right, or no, you're always wrong. We need a community. Every parish is a community. Every school and seminary is a community. We need each other. We especially need people who we love who we don't always agree with. And uh, we have, you know, in, I'm, I'm clearly not a theologian. I don't even know if I, I may have overstated the, the, the idea that uh, refusing the vaccine is a sin of pride. I don't know that the Pope ever actually said those words. And so I don't know if I've got my theology of the Trinity correct, but the fact that we worship a God who is a community tells us something about the nature of who we are and who we ought to be as the image and likeness of God. Thank you very much. Great. I have a PhD and it took me about 10 minutes to figure out how to turn this on. Um, so we are now turning to Q&A. Again, you're welcome to line up at uh, either of the uh, microphones, the right or the left. Um, we'll begin with a uh, um, question we have from online. Uh, and uh, this is directed to both of you. A feeling I've had over the last two years, in the degree, disagreements over vaccines and measures such as face masks and distancing recommendations is that there's too much concern for earthly life and not enough concern for eternal life. I've used that feeling as a reason to avoid learning about the science behind these recommendations. How would you challenge me to think differently? Oh, 
I'll let you have the last word. God so loved the world that he sent his son. There is um, a phrase, I think it was John Polkinghorne, um, the Anglican scientist priest. We are not apprentice angels. We are not lumps of meat in which our souls are trapped trying to get out. But rather, our bodies are the creation that God has given us. What happens on this earth, in this life, with the people we are around and the planet we're standing on, matters so much that God sent his son to redeem it. So to divide the world into earthly and heavenly is an interesting religion, but it's not Christianity. And uh, is this turned on? Okay. Oh. Yeah, and to dovetail on that, um, I was immediately, when I heard the question, reminded of the Anglican biblical scholar N.T. Wright, who, with the organization BioLogos, has put out you know, beautiful reflections on faith and science. And one of them, he goes into the history, not of um, uh, Charles Darwin, but his grandfather, Erasmus Darwin. And when he goes into that, because uh, Erasmus Darwin lived in Litchfield and so did N.T. Wright for a brief period of time. He said that the philosophical concept that of what he would call an epicanarian uh, worldview of God is something way, 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 way out there and we're here and there's this deistic vision of this extreme distance with God um, trickled into uh, the, the science of Charles Darwin so that when you saw things that you can easily observe, as I mentioned, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth made it very clear that we should not fear evolution. But when we see evolution, if it's a particularly godless um, type of thing, and that gets into the whole God of the gaps, that well, if we can naturally explain it, then at that point, then that that's quote unquote not God in the things that we can't explain. That's where God is, and so therefore the reason I was connecting it with that question on vaccination, there can be, as Brother Guy pointed out, that a metaphysical dualism that sets in, that somehow if the material world becomes as science be, is able to define the world better and better, more godless, the you know, if, if the way that you look for God in the world is by trying to find the gaps where that you can't explain, but as science explains those gaps, there's less and less and less of the gap to deal with, then all of a sudden, well, then we live in a godless world. So why am I here? Well, maybe I should get out of here. And N.T. Wright said that sadly the church colluded with this from the standpoint of creating a soteriology of which heaven is a place way, way up there that we go away to. Again, kind of feeding that deistic tendency that somehow God is some enigmous thing that's beyond billions and billions of light years away and isn't here among us now. And that goes back to, you know, in seminary, my primary does, um, interest was in sacramental theology, our theology of the liturgy. Is heaven something light years away? I know I'm quoting a hymn that everybody hates. Um, but no, heaven is more of a this. It's the material, you know, every liturgy is the meeting of, um, you know, the earthly liturgy, the heavenly liturgy. And so therefore to the question of, you know, well, I'm not going to do this because I'm more concerned about heaven and I'm not concerned about here. We should be concerned about here because as Catholics, what I used to use with my students is matter matters. The material world um, matters to us. Now, other Christian denominations would be more Gnostic in their, in their propensity of, you know, of 
Not all born again denominations, but some have more of that sense of, you know, we're living in a rotten cesspool. All that really matters is, you know, trying to get to this idealized form. Um, and so therefore, I would say as Catholics, if anything, the only ones, in my opinion, that would have a, a deeper connection with faith and creation would be the Orthodox, ironically, which is a whole other discussion for another time in terms of, you know, the Orthodox. Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox actually speak of the sacrament of creation, not in a pantheistic manner, but in terms of what God's made, what God makes is sacred, it's sacramental. So creation itself has a sacramental character. We don't disagree with that in the West. We're just a little bit more nervous because of pantheism with the idea of speaking of the, the sacrament of creation. That gets into a little bit nervous territory for us in the West. But anyway. Thank you. So uh, we'll switch the microphones here on, to the right. Uh, thanks for both of your talks. Um, there we go. Is that better? So thanks for both of your talks. Uh, it was actually very refreshingly intellectually stimulating, which I've never used those three words together. Uh, people that know me, not the biggest intellectual person. So that was very, very helpful. So my question is um, considered of the, the common good. So the confusing question of we can still transmit COVID even if we do have the vaccine. And so how we participate in the common good feels like a little bit uh, like too much in the sense of like, well, if I have it, I could spread it. If I don't have it, I could still spread it. Um, so I guess my question on how we contribute to the common good with that, but also too with some of the masks mandates and the social distancing, when does the common good um, have like a tipping point where we just um, kind of eliminate community and fostering good relationships and uh, being together um, for the sake of a lot of what the CDC says. Um, so those are the questions I wrestle with as far as contributing to the common good. So if you can comment on um, any part of that, that'd be great. Well, I could go a little bit into the science of why um, being vaccinated, though you can transmit it, you're not uh, turning yourself into a petri dish where you're generating new variants. But more to the point, we need you. The common good needs you, needs you to be alive, needs you to be a priest 40 years from now, needs you to be the friend and neighbor. And so we need you to survive. Um, as far as the problem of where the tipping point is, I will grant you the existence of the tipping point. And there will be a place, but frankly, I don't think we're anywhere near that tipping point. If you can't have friends wearing a mask, then you've never lived in a Wisconsin winter. <laughs> yeah, I would say for me, in addition to everything that you heard, I'm also Dean of the Eau Claire Deanery, which means I probably talk with the CDC depending on where spikes are at least twice a week. Um, Eau Claire County has arguably the most safe, most COVID conscious county in the state of Wisconsin. And being that uh, Governor Evers statewide mandate was uh, overturned and it ended up being county to county as we were talking last night. I literally live, my house is a quarter mile from the border of Chippewa County. Those are two different COVID worlds <laughs> because of two very different CDCs. <laughs> and even for me, because I have to, I oversee five schools as part of a uh, school system. I have to do routine walkthroughs with members of the CDC to, you know, to check COVID safety protocols. And I think that gets into the human dimension when you talk to about the tipping point. Are there certain members from the Eau Claire Health Department that when I see them, I say, oh, thank goodness it's them. Yeah, are there other people I'm like, oh no. <laughs> Yeah, and that's kind of the human dimension on how even, you know, it's, it, and we, we have to be careful, not just with, you know, our mentality of CDC, but again, it goes into that distrust of, of, uh, of public authority. Um, I have 
there's often kind of this presumption of almost like the CDC is running our world right now. Well, in the state of Wisconsin, the CDC ain't running much of anything, to be quite frank. Um, I think that, uh, you know, depending on where you go, um, it's pretty safe that Wisconsin right now is probably one of the loosest states, you know, when you drive around when it comes to COVID protocols. So to Brother Guy's point, I don't even think, at least in the state of Wisconsin, we're anywhere near the tipping point. Now, do I understand what's going on in Canada that has led to, uh, you know, the big traffic jam on the, the bridge between uh, Toronto and Detroit? No, I don't know what the reality, of, the reality of, of Canada is, so I can't speak to that. The thing that I would just say to that is that from my experience of losing a lot of hair, having to literally work with this on a daily basis as a dean, I have yet to find anybody who wants to kill anybody. And I have yet to find anybody who's trying to spark a socialist overthrow of the United States government through mask wearing. Um, neither one of those realities exist. What I do find is a lot of good people, hardworking people that have strong opinions on COVID. And we're all, to both Brother Guy and I's presentation, and I think one of the, if you remember nothing else, and this might not be deflating to hear, we're all looking for very certain, precise, exact answers. And with COVID, there just isn't any. You know, that oftentimes we're, we're doing the best with the information in front of us. And so I would say that for us, you know, kindness, gentleness, you know, now, are, would, could there be potentially a, you know, a, a circumstance where somebody might try to spark a political uprising for, I mean, sure, but we're not, that's not where we're at. That's not what we're living through. So I would say, trust the CDC from the standpoint of not that, oh, I have to finally accept everything that the, this county says about COVID-19. No, you can still have questions about it, but trust the people that they're good people and trust that they actually might be in your pews, as I have two people that work for the CDC that are in my pews, and they're not out to destroy the church. If anything, they're just as fed up about it as we are. So, and I, that might not be the clearest answer, but that's kind of what, what I see from my, my, parish, my parish experience. And I, I want to, one thing I see on the conservative extreme and I, and I don't want to offend anybody here, it's just an honest assessment. Be careful to try to turn ourselves into Poland during the Nazi and the communist occupation. I, I hear that a lot in some of, of dear friends of mine that are strong conservatives. And this isn't Poland during the Nazi and the communist, you know, uh, occupations. Um, so don't, don't try to create a reality that that isn't there because sadly, as I was at the end of my presentation, we might accidentally get it if we, if we act like it long enough, so. Thank you. So we'll uh, question from this side and I should have asked this earlier, if you could please um, introduce yourself and your, uh, your diocese or sponsor. Okay, uh, my name is Michael. I'm from the diocese of Green Bay. Um, I know, I'm sure many of us had, have had an experience where you're talking with someone and they'll say, well, the science actually shows this and they'll give like any number of opinions that contradict what you've commonly heard. Um, so how does one go about parsing through that and then also responding to it as someone who isn't an expert in the field? Show me the data. Right. It's, it, it's the difficulty that uh, who is the authority? This is, comes back to the question we have all the time. Who is the authority? Uh, a friend of mine from grade school is one of these people who has all the, the papers he's found on the internet. And his nephew is saying, you know, what's happening to Ken? Well, his nephew actually is a UFO nut, and he's the voice of reason in the family. <laughs> um, the answer is, I'm not the expert, and he's not the expert. And don't think that you're going to find the hidden truth that the rest of the world doesn't know about. 
that doesn't happen. It doesn't happen in science, it doesn't happen in religion, it doesn't happen in philosophy. Yeah, the last time it happened was when St. Paul showed up in Corinth. And we haven't seen a St. Paul since. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Joel for the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. Um, two things I wanted to bring up and then tie them together into a question. So publication bias, which you probably both have heard of before, is a phenomenon where if you have a study that says you do A, good thing B happens, and another study that says you do A, bad thing B happens, there's a severe bias towards positive associated results being published and negative results not being published. So I, that's my first point. The second point, um, about three years ago, I read an article in First Things and um, it reported about increasing calls in academia for what they call the queering of science, which would have every study reviewed by a board to ensure that the study's conclusions do not offend LGBTQ sensibilities and thus could prevent certain studies from being published. So when I think of these two factors, I have two questions. One, do you think that faithful application of the scientific method is or will be inhibited in the future? And two, does it not then seem better for a Christian to make decisions more so based on principles than scientific knowledge in a potentially low trust environment? No, and we're a faith that believes in faith and reason. You, you get my answer. All right, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Matthew Kehoe for the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. Um, I guess I have uh, two points to start with uh, before the question. Um, the first one is it seems like uh, generally scientific studies are not the problem in people's minds when dealing with this issue, but it's a ma um, more the matter of prudence um, and how our political system works. Um, the second one being that in the United States, we've determined that our political system is determined as a democracy. And so in that case, we don't have particular experts when it comes to making prudential decisions, um, that it is something by the people. Um, so how does that apply to um, us if we're going to be clerics who are supposed to deal with the particular as opposed to the common good? I know um, at one point uh, you had mentioned, um, um, you know, you don't want to let the, the weak go by the wayside and that it's our job to take care of them. Um, that is the case as clerics, but then how does that work in the case of a democracy? Um, where there are competing goods, where safety, um, as Brother Guy pointed out, is not always the best thing. It's not always the best approach um, because sometimes to actually accomplish something and to win a race that requires leaving safety by the wayside. Um, how do we interact with that as Christians in a democracy? And I would say, first of all, you have to, I'm presuming you're talking about a democracy in the United States, because there are variants between countries of democracy. Would that be a correct presumption? Yeah, question? Sorry. From that presumption, I mean, what were we taught since, since we were this, you know, tall, bring me your broken, bring your, me your downtrodden, bring me your rejected. Um, the very foundation of our democracy is that the marginalized and the least have a voice, um, which also then is one of the reasons that was a connection with our preferential option for the poor of why we see, can, can see a connection between um, our faith and what our democracy is. If our democracy becomes, well, sadly, the weak will have to, to die in order for us to become strengthened. The marginalized will have to be eliminated. Now we're talking Nazis. Now we're talking a reawakening of the worst of our human background. If we really, and again, as I said, not even Dawkins thinks that we should adapt natural selection into our political ideology. Um, if we become the country of, you know, well, Maybe eugenics was right, after all. We're, we're becoming the very thing we claim to detest. 
the issue of how you uh, deal with expertise in a democracy is, it's in a sense a solved problem. It's a real problem, but it's a solved one. That's, you know, in the past you would have hearings. You would bring in a number of experts from different points of view. You'd figure out where they agree. You try to understand the nature of where they disagree and then make the best decisions you could based on what you think is the right thing. Where our democracy has broken at the moment is that um, every vote is a party vote. Every committee is uh, along party lines. There's too few places where we will listen to or expect to hear or trust people of the opposite party. And when I was growing up, I grew up in a fairly well-to-do suburb of Detroit, and I was, you know, my, from a family of Republicans, and Republicans were not evil people. And we had lots of friends who were blue collar and they were Democrats and they were not evil people. And we could disagree about the nature of the solutions or even disagree on what were the most important things to, but we could argue about it and then, you know, go out to dinner and have, uh, have, have, you know, have fun together because we still respected each other. We still loved each other. In the 60s, I saw a tendency of people on one party to create a stereotype of what those evil people in the other party were like. And the stereotypes become self-fulfilling. So the first step is to, even though you think and you're convinced those other people will never listen, to never give up hope that there are good people on the other side, whichever the other side is, and that even though, you know, Lucy's pulled the ball away, I'm going to keep trying to, to, you know, kick the ball. Because if I stop assuming that the other side are always evil people, maybe they'll start living up to that, and maybe I'll start living up to it as well. It's, um, it's sad that every election is a moral crusade to make sure the evil other side doesn't win because the other side isn't evil they're not evil people they can be mistaken people but they're not evil people and we as christians at the very beginning have to recognize that just because they're sinners doesn't mean that they're evil we have to trust even in the face of disappointment we have to trust that we will live through this to a time when we can talk to each other again. Uh, Father Justin Kaczewski, a priest from the Diocese of La Crosse, uh, adjunct here at Sacred Heart and then formator at St. Francis de Sales and, and former pastor of Chippewa County. Um, <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Boom. Um, so, you know, anyhow, full disclosure. Um, no, uh, thank you for both of your presentations. Very thoughtful. I uh, really appreciated a, a great deal of the insights um, that, you, that you pointed out. One question, and I'm having a difficulty figuring out how to ask my question. Um, and I think it's this, um, what if, what if the son of, uh, and son-in-law of your friend didn't make a mistake? I think is the way I want to ask the question, provided that, yeah, he likely would have lived, but I guess my, is it a problem? And you kind of answered it just then, that we can't imagine that people who are deciding differently are also potentially acting reasonably. And so like imagining that space where they do maybe have their reasons or are acting reasonably. And if we can't imagine that scenario, um, or we're imagining a scenario only if they're doing those kinds of things that all these drastic things are going to happen, um, in a sense, like, have we lost that ability, like even here, to communicate? Well, there, there's two points to, to the story of the fellow I'm calling Michael. The first is he himself made the judgment that he had made the mistake, mm -hmm. and he did die. Mm -hmm. Simply because it's difficult, you know, in, in retrospect to say, oh, I should have known better, which of course is true of everything. 
there was a right thing to do. Maybe it wasn't clear that it was the right thing to do at the time. It's true in every moral decision that every one of us makes. And at the time, we can be blind or we can talk ourselves in or out of whatever decision we made. And we all have the experience of, boy, I made a really terrible mistake, which led me to this actually pretty good place where I am now. <laughs> because God can take the decisions we make and, and, you know, and, and do good things with them. We have to recognize that the people we disagree with were doing the best they could in the situation they were in and not hate them for it, just as Michael's family doesn't hate him. And we also have to appreciate that um, the loss of life that came was a tragedy and a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And both of those things can be true. Mm -hmm. And I would say, I mean, it was more directed to Brother Guy, but you know, what, to the thing that, and it kind of goes into what I was trying to, to get at at the end of my presentation about human dignity. Why did I do something different than what Bishop Callahan put forward for us for COVID protocols? And basically what he encouraged is that we have part of the church that's roped off social distance, um, you know, the, uh, you know, masks and so forth. And then another section that basically has nothing, um, essentially. The reason being is that I literally had a member of my men's club. I decided instead to socially distance the entire church. And then being that we have MERV 13 filter, filtration, which uh, filters out um, uh, water droplets from water vapor. We, I'm one of the few parishes that's blessed with an incredibly wide space. Social distancing is not a problem you know, for us given the space of it. I felt safe as a pastor allowing mask wearing to be optional in the pews because we had everything else in place. And I got criticism from my parishioners because of the mentality of one of the men's clubs said, Father, why don't you have all those people that want to be safe? Why don't you make a little section and have them over there? No. I mean, that's, and I'm not talking COVID now, I'm talking about something in here and something in here. And I've just been very emphatic with my parish. We're a community, and we're a community that has strong opinions on COVID on both ends. We have to love each other through this and at the end of this. I am not gonna segregate my parish. I am not going to say, you know, cause then that can bleed into a relativistic heart. There's one truth over here and one truth over there. No, it's, um, we need to do the best that we can. And that's where the lack of certitude piece comes in for me. Can I sit here and say as a priest of the Diocese of the Cross that I have made no mistakes during how I've handled COVID in the parish? I wish I could, but to be quite frank, I don't think any, any pastor could say yet with confidence, I did the right thing from day one. With the exception of the handful of priests that decided to do absolutely nothing from the beginning, or decided to basically wrap all their people in bubble wrap as they came in for mass on the weekends. On the extremes, they can say that they did the right thing. And for me, ironically, I don't believe that either of those extremes were the right thing. Um, it's tough, you know, and as, you know, brother, the thing that, you know, sin is revealed in the heart of the sinner to your friend, you know, he, it was revealed in his heart that a grave mistake was made. And, and I'm not going to speculate that he was wrong in his discernment. Thank you. I'm John Zweber from the Diocese of La Crosse. Hopefully, Father remembers me because he was my pastor for a little bit. But if you want, you can win the darn life. best altar server I've ever had in my life. <laughs> I 
And like I said, uh, he probably doesn't, your homiletics professor thinks you're darn pretty darn good. So I just uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, anyway, continue well, on. I was going to say, uh, you could wait until after I ask the question to acknowledge that. But John, I've told you from day one, you're smarter than me. So go right ahead. So I was thinking uh, the summer after COVID broke, I was in a small parish and uh, COVID didn't exist there either at the start. <laughs> um, and I remember. As when, was the case in many parishes. Right. <laughs> I remember when the mask mandate came came out and after mass there's this lady who's pretty pretty upset about it and she's comes up to father she's like hey father sorry i, I don't think i can follow this because the governor is pro-choice and uh, i thought to myself and now i'm pretty pro-life but there's no way i can turn that into a logical syllogism <laughs> and uh but I, I think there's something there something a little bit deeper than her lack of logic um, and I think as I got to know her, it was the fact that she had been uh, the same authority telling her that she had to wear a mask was the same authority that kept her away from masks for weeks. It was the same authority that kept her neighbor outside the hospital as her husband died on the inside without COVID. Um, and it's the same authority too that kept her from really a lot of these personal health decisions that she thought she should be able to make. So in some ways, I don't think it was a lack of uh, logic. I don't think it was pride, but I think it's what a lot of us are struggling with is a deep hurt, a uh, sense in being let down by the authority. Um, and there's never on one hand really been an apology for that. And so I, I'm wondering, it seems like a lot of what's happening is a, a desire to boycott the authority. Um, and uh, a lot of how that gets turned into is a look at the science saying, trying to reject the sort of uh, usurpation of power in these authorities. Um, but how do, you, how do you, I guess, maybe to state the question more succinctly, how do you voice your hurt and your distaste for sometimes what authority has done without rejecting the science mm -hmm. and while still, I, I guess, heading in a positive direction moving forward? I think that's a great question. So you're still in my good graces, John. So <laughs> <laughs> to that, there's a lot of things uh, that I could comment to, you know, for, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to parse it out. And if I miss anything that you said, just refresh me because it was a very detailed question. Number one, ironically, the parishioner in her protest pointed out the very thing that I think we missed at the very beginning of not seeing this as a political issue or but to see it as a life issue that there's part of me that would want like, yeah, amen, wearing a mask can be seen as being pro-life. And I think that again, from that weave of Catholic social teaching, what does it mean to support human dignity from conception till natural death? Um, what does it mean to um, have a preferential option for the poor? What does it mean to really have a sense that we are called by our teaching um, as a church to, to protect the most vulnerable within our society? So from that standpoint, I, I would say that ironically in her protest, you are not far from the kingdom of heaven, to quote um, from scripture. Now the other piece gets dicey because I'm presuming what you're saying is that the authority meant Governor Evers. The, no, the problem is we have a Democrat governor in Wisconsin but this, all the safety provisions started in, so I'm presuming that's what she meant by the pro-choice governor. Um, President Trump was a Republican. So, well then who do you blame for all the shutdown? Is it President Trump? Is it Governor Evers? Is it the Republicans, is it the Democrats? And that's where you get into the rabbit hole of everything that is, you know, it, it's just an endless sea of ugh, very precise theological term. Um, what caused the shutdown 
our uncertainty of what COVID was. Something that's a, a historical fact that we sometimes forget. This isn't the first time the church shut down. Um, during the, the Spanish flu pandemic, the church shut down. Um, there have been shutdowns in countries in the past. Um, and in the past, it was never seen as an affront. It was never seen as immoral or a lack of faith. But for some reason, this time it was. For some, for many. And so I would just say, based on historical precedence, I would encourage her to reflect on the fact that, you know, this isn't the power suppressing the people. This is the uncertainty of a disease that, I mean, and, and let's face it right now, COVID cases and infections are skyrocketed in comparison to where they were when we were in shutdown. So if that logic of that person is consistent, we shouldn't be having this event right now. Um, we shouldn't be doing anything. And again, that's that part of, well, as we're learning about this and coming out of this. So, you know, for me, it, um, the political dimension of it is very dicey. And that's why for me, I really try to stay as much as I can away from it because with political voices I have in our community, as I said before, nobody's trying to spark a overthrow or a, a, a suppression of the church. Is an apology necessary? That's an interesting question. I've never heard that question asked before. And I can see that going in both directions. Um, hindsight's twenty twenty. Was there an overreaction? Well, maybe in light of what we've been through. But in that moment in, you know, I just remember at one of the first stories was that I saw was in Kentucky, a Baptist church where the pastor said, ah, COVID's not real. And like two weeks later, he and about 50 of his parishioners were dead. Um, it was a scary time. I was down in Arizona on sabbatical when it hit. It was a scary time. And so therefore, in my opinion, I think people were doing the best they could with the limited amount of information they had. And I have faith that there isn't anything devious going on within our political system or there isn't anything devious in the church happening with politically selling out or anything because we're here and we're meeting. And if there was something that was trying to be imposed upon us, the COVID infection numbers now would make a much stronger argument for a complete shutdown than what happened at the beginning. Does that make sense, John? Or do you have a follow-up for me? Or? Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, one thing I would say is maybe I do have a different approach myself going through it and seeing uh, how serious it was or how serious it wasn't. I do have a different kind of approach to where that tipping point might be. <laughs> Um, to me, I think it was really hard when the churches shut down their doors, yeah. especially some of the, the ways people were kept out of hospitals. But I, I think regardless of that, we're past that point now. Um, and there is this question of what do we do with this desire that people have to boycott the injustices that were done? Uh, putting a, a piece of cloth on your face isn't really that bad. I mean, if an 80 year old guy can do it, I can do it at 10 miles an hour on a treadmill. But, but the fact is, I think for many people, it's becoming very hard and very hard to breathe in when that's uh, done under command of obedience. Um, and, and so I, I guess maybe the question is like, how do we work forward with uh, at least the feeling of injustice that's there? I'm, I'll take it in a slightly different track. All of the things that you know you're saying these people are complaining about, I can see the logic behind them. I can see why they were necessary. In fact, it's so obvious and self, so self-evident, it would never have occurred to me that somebody needed it explained to them. And in that sense, I would have been wrong. I'm sitting now in a room of people who are going to be called upon to be authorities in your parishes, in your communities. 
this is a lesson not to make that mistake. This is a lesson to see if we can, rather than saying this is what obviously needs to be done, do it, uh, to see if there is a way that we can produce a consensus that people can see enough of the information that they will, as a community, come to these decisions. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you get, just got to make the decision right now because nobody else is there and you've got to do it. But the need constantly to communicate. Unfortunately, I'm a scientist. I'm a nerd. Most scientists and most nerds are in this job because we're lousy at communication. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a challenge we all face. But this is also why you don't do it yourself. You find a buddy who's good at communication to help you explain. And all of us should be suspicious of those who want to attack the person rather than the, the decision, the ad hominem attack. Uh, I go back to the, one of the most powerful things I just heard you say, describing the people I know who are in the CDC who do this. They're not bad people. They're trying to do their best. They might be wrong, they might be stupid, but they're not bad people. And every one of us who's not in that position should be thankful we're not. <laughs> It's just a, a quick follow. I really stuck my foot in my mouth one time just on the CDC point of um, one time I was, there's this one person in, in the CDC that just really grinds me whenever I get a phone call from her, a letter from her, and there was a parishioner I was complaining to, you know, I'm like, oh gosh, you know, this, that, and everything else. And it was one of those insert foot in mouth moments because she's like, oh, I'm her ghost writer. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so my gut tells me I'm not going to see a mess for the next couple of weeks. And, you know, <laughs> um, she forgave me and she laughed and she's like, don't worry, father. It's, it's not the first time we've heard this, you know, to the, to the, um, when you were, you know, kind of talking about, was there hurt? Absolutely. There was hurt. There was a sense of loss of priestly identity through that, um, you know, for me too, after I got back from sabbatical, um, of not having the community. And my hope is, you know, to answer your question, how do we come through it? Um, if we keep on the, in my opinion, the, the protest cycle on both sides, it really, it's run its course. It's it's not creating anything constructive anymore. Um, you know whether it's you know jamming up the bridge to Detroit um, over the river, whether it's violence in cities over you know what people presume about uh, you know a police situation or something, and we get, we have to find a way to say you know what. Yeah, there probably were a lot of mistakes made. And I don't think that we all know exactly what those mistakes were. Um, again, you know, just talking with, you know, a couple of bishops I know not well, they went on historical precedents. You know, how have we handled this in the past? When this has happened, what do we do? And they followed what small t tradition had done with these situations. But that's an interesting question. Is there a need for an apology? I don't know. And that's something I'll be taking to prayer. So thank you for that. Thank you, Father. So I've been given one job and one job alone, which is to make sure we're done by three. Um, so we, are, we have two more questions, one on my right, one on my left. Which one is more righteous is up to you. Um, but we'll begin on this side. Hi, my name is Bill Murray, seminarian for the Archdiocese of Milwaukee and First Theology. Uh, my question is, uh, and, and this is dealing with uh, uh, typologies. So even though that this scenario is based on a real person, it's not about this specific person. Uh, there's a, a deacon or a priest that uh, chooses to be unvaccinated and he visits the hospitals, he visits the sick and with the uh, with uh, 
consultation and consent of the person in the hospital decides to not wear his mask and to forego uh, protocols for this person's desire that he's uh, serving. And he himself is 85 years old. So he's part of the vulnerable as well and decides to be unvaccinated. Is he a menace to the common good? Or is he a living icon of the Christ who's not afraid of the leper? A little bit of both. <laughs> um, before I was vaccinated, I went to the hospitals too. And I'm a little bit head scratching on your scenario because if I would have taken off my mask before I was vaccinated and they wrapped me in the makeshift hazmat suit and had, if I took my masks off, the medical personnel would have booted me out of the hospital and wouldn't have let me into the room. So first I would, I'd be curious to figure out what care facility let an 85 year old man go and unmask to somebody who is incubated and is literally having spit and slobber fly out of his mouth into his face. Um, you know, it, um, can there be a, a certain sense of heroic virtue? Um, I hope I don't sound arrogant, but I was kind of scared even, you know, with, you know, getting being put in the safety equipment, unvaccinated to anoint people in the hospital because I felt it was my priestly duty to do so, to go into those situations. Um, would I have been more heroic by not donning anything? I don't think I would have been smart. Um, yeah, there are priests that weren't afraid of the lepers and there are priests who died of leprosy. So does that mean the 85 year old priest was wrong and I was right? No, we're both trying to be a priest. We're both trying to do our priestly ministry in the difficulties of COVID-19. It wasn't pleasant watching nurses set cell phones around the dying person with the family members on, you know, on, uh, on speaker phone and you could hear the weeping and the family said, Father, we can only have one person in the room. Our mom would want to be anointed, so you're going to be the person in the room. I don't, personally, I would prefer not to comment whether or not I would have been more or less of a priest if I had wore a mask or not. Um, or that one reality or the other objectively would, would uh, call me um, you know, a good priest or a bad priest. We got to get away from that. We've got way too much of, you know, this priest is good, this one's horrible. Got to get away from that. Because sadly, what happens if we cling to that too, too much as future priests of God, you're suddenly going to become either the good priest or the bad priest. And you're going to have that experience of, but no, I'm doing the best that I can. Why are you calling me godless? Like I was saying in my presentation and the person saying it won't care what what's going on in here. We're brothers. Let's love each other. Let's assist, let's assist each other in our policy ministry. Um, let's not play who's heroic and who's not. I think anyone who considers priesthood in this day and age is heroic. And so let's go together as brothers to face the realities and the struggles we face. One other comment I'll make. Um, I look around this room, a lot of people in black shirts with white collars. And I'm someone who took vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, of which by far the hardest is obedience, but which also is the source of the strength of the religious order that I'm a part of, and I think the source of the strength of being a priesthood in a church rather than somebody who's invented his own religion. Someone who is standing with and part of and a function of the Roman Catholic Church has to set a little bit of their own, you know, 
instincts aside, if they have been told, don't do this, don't do this, you've got to have a phenomenally strong reason to disagree with the instructions of you know, the local ordinary. And presumably, in where this person is, the ordinary would have said, don't do that. And the ordinaries themselves are under some sort of obedience to the Pope. When everybody tries to be the lone wolf, um, the strength of the church falls apart. To shift the, the spotlight a little bit, a large part of the horror of the sex abuse crisis was not that there were men who behaved badly, because if you have a thousand men, you will have 10 who behave badly. It was that the institutional church did not respond correctly, because we had lost that sense of we are responsible for each other, and we are responsible for the behavior of each other. Um, is it outrageous to compare this 85-year-old deacon to somebody who's abusing children? Of course it's outrageous. But if you can see the commonality, then you can see why I would have less um, sympathy for him. Final question. Hi, I'm Jacob Bovey from the Diocese of Green Bay. Uh, and I wanted to first thank uh, John Drubber for asking most of my question uh, before I could get to it. <laughs> um, but he knocked down eight pins, and you're going in for the for the for the spare. You gotcha. You gotcha. <laughs> so on the on the topic of um, authority, uh, and often the polemicism which has colored our um, world today. Uh, you know we've. A lot of the theme of this this very talk, you know, the the polemity that is held between faith, reason, Democrat, Republican, you know, things that aren't really meant to be opposed, but but are um, in the in the public. That how do we, uh, especially as as people who are going to be holding some authority, answer that um, that call to to reunite? Uh, people who are tempted to to divide themselves into different camps. This is going to sound counterintuitive on the surface, but trust me, presume you're not going to be trusted. <laughs> and, and, and I mean that sincerely. Pr presume that whatever room you walk into, whether it's parish council, finance council, whether it's presume they're going to question you and they're going to be like, why should I listen to you? And to me, when that happens, it's pretty easy to feel insulted because I'm just like, well, I'm a relatively well-educated person and, and uh, how dare you think I'm an idiot? <laughs> Believe me, I don't care whoever the smartest seminarian is here that you think is in this room. When you get a parish, you're going to be dumb. <laughs> Not necessarily in terms of, you know, you're not going to magically lose your brain, but your people are not going to trust you at first. And you got to earn it. You got to earn that trust with them. You got to show them that you love them appropriately in Christ. You have to show that them that, and, and that in a weird way, I think, is the silver lining grace of the sex abuse scandal. I'm actually okay that I have families that look at me and say, Prove to me you're not going to hurt my children. Prove to me you're not going to hurt this parish. Now, they don't come out and say that, but I mean, I'm okay with having people hold me to a higher standard. And that's something that all of us need to be careful. I, I grew up in a Polish mill family. Um, and if you grew up in a Polish mill family, you know that uh, before seminary, I could give the vulgarity with the best of them. I mean, I, I would go to, when, I, when my dad and I would go to his friend's house that worked in the, pol in the paper mills, I would hear swear words where I'm like, I didn't realize you could use those words in combination like that. There was almost a, there was almost an artistry to what they were doing. But when I got to seminary, I still used all that verbiage. And I'm like, I got to get that out of my system. 
why because if i you know use the eloquent connection of vulgarity with a parishioner done you are done is it fair maybe maybe not but it's reality and so at the same time though too don't create such a mentality where i can never make a mistake then one of the worst pieces of advice i ever got from a priest was you're going to be teaching at a high school yeah when you say something wrong in your classroom, never admit it. <laughs> never admit that you, you, you biffed. Never admit that you messed up. You're, you just find a way. What horrible advice. Because, and you're not too far separated from my high school students. I'm sorry to, I don't, <laughs> I'm getting old. <laughs> You all can see a fake from a mile away. So don't be fake. If you make a mistake, ask for forgiveness. If you make a big mistake, talk to somebody to get help. And, you know, it just, it, um, authenticity and vulnerability, two words that are scary for seminarians and priests. Um, but once you understand how to live that with healthy boundaries in a holy manner, power, not power in the doo -doo -doo -doo, but empowerment in Christ, because then you can let the Holy Spirit work through you in that humility and that vulnerability and that transparency and that authenticity. And I'll, I'll add, as someone who you know, runs an outfit, the Vatican Observatory, I've got 12 very bright, very independent scientists from 12 different cultures and four countries, four continents and the rest. You will never get credit for the things you do, so you'd better not be doing it for the credit you'll get. You will always get blamed for the things you did and sometimes for the things you didn't do. And that better not worry you either. The great advantage that everybody in this room has is that you should know at some level what's going to happen is that the Holy Spirit is going to work through you. And that means that you can enjoy the good things that happen, not because you did it, but because, wow, the Holy Spirit did that. That's so cool. And you can't be afraid when the bad things happen because the Holy Spirit has a way of turning the bad things into good things. Uh, you absolutely have to leave your ego at the door, but don't leave your sense of humor at the door and don't leave your awe of what the Holy Spirit can do, even through a flawed person like yourself. And again, I'm not trying to flawed person like yourself. That just hit me. If you would have told um, a mill rat kid from rural central Wisconsin who lived outside a city of 795 people, who has dyslexia, who struggled to get through college, who was put on academic probation while he was in college until he got diagnosed and figured out how his brain works with learning. If you would have told him when he was considering leaving college to take a job at the paper mill and follow his dad because at least I'd be making money instead of being constantly being shown that I'm a failure. Um, if I would have let that kid not be exposed to the grace of Christ, I wouldn't be here. None of the things that I do would have happened. Um, I want to have been given one of the greatest gifts. I mean, the greatest gift has been my faith in Christ and my priesthood and pretty close up there is that this guy trusts me to write for him. That never would have happened if I would have not let that broken kid in college be exposed to God's grace. Um, it's okay to admit we're all broken. Um, it's also okay to let Christ step in and heal that brokenness, even though it will scare the living daylights out of you in the process at times. Could we give a round of applause to our... And now I call the director, Father Raul, to lead us in closing prayer. 
want to add my thanks also to Brother Guy and Father James for the very stimulating presentations, for the many thoughts that are going in in, in my head and my heart, as well as I'm sure in, in yours. This is part of what it means to be in a seminary as well. We're exposed to many new ideas, many things that challenge us, but also feed us. And so thank you for being part of that process. So I'd like to commend what we do here to the Blessed Mother. And I'd like to do that using the prayer uh, that was composed for the icon in the chapel, a prayer to Mary, Mother of Compassion. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed Mary, Mother of Compassion, by God's grace, you show us your Son, Jesus, our Redeemer. Through the Holy Spirit, he was born one of us. Through his death and resurrection, he knows our brokenness and our joys. Through his passion, he knows our pain, even the pain no one else knows. Mary, full of grace, pray for us that we may always see the path to your son and so turn to him with joyful hope in this way, may we bring praise and thanksgiving to God, the gracious giver of all that is good. Amen. God bless you.